If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more. Yeah, their money has free speech to live by. Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to ending corporate domination and creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. I'm your host, David Delk. The Obama administration continues to push for another new free trade agreement based on the NAFTA model called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Involving 12 Pacific Rim nations, the TPP will cover over 40% of the world's economy. Even so, it's being negotiated with an unprecedented level of secrecy. And the administration is also moving forward with negotiations of a transatlantic agreement as well. So on December 7th here in Portland, the Alliance for Democracy and the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign organized a public forum to continue developing the opposition to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Our program today features some of the presentations given at the forum, including one by me as president of the Alliance for Democracy Portland chapter. My name is David Delk and I'm the president of the Portland chapter of the Alliance for Democracy. So I'm going to focus my comments today on the undemocratic nature and the effects of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and this whole web of global governance uh, which has been created by the free trade agreements that have been created up to this time. So first, the very process of negotiating this particular agreement has been very undemocratic. One hallmark of democratic governance is transparency, yet with the TPP, the level of, of secrecy has been unprecedented. Um, with the TPP, negotiators have been sworn to secrecy. Congress people who have seen the text have been sworn to secrecy. Even during the Bush years, the government actually released negotiating text on government websites for interested parties to see and to discuss. Uh, and under Bush, Congress was actually involved with the negotiations, but not with the TP. Even our U.S. representatives and senators have been denied access to the text, and when they have been allowed to see it, they're not permitted to take cameras, paper, pens into the room uh, where they read the text or to take notes. And, of course, they are all sworn to secrecy, so even though they might be able to look at it, they can't talk about it. Um, so, in spite of the fact that we have all been excluded, 600 corporate lobbyists have been granted special status to see, read, comment on, and many times to actually write the text of the agreement. Uh, so, just on that level, the TPP process has been extremely undemocratic. But we, we do have an idea what the effects of the TPP uh, will be because some text has been, been leaked including chapters uh, involved with, the, with investments and intellectual property rights. And WikiLeaks just uh, released uh, the full text of the property rights chapter uh, just a couple weeks ago, so we can see you know, what, the, what the United States has proposed and what our trading partners, uh, you know, how they have reacted. They haven't reacted uh, very positively to the American proposals. But not only is the negotiating process undemocratic, the agreement itself is an attack on democracy. All governments answer the question, who gets to decide? Prior to the American Revolution, the answer was the king. The king was the decider. The Trans-Pacific Partnership and most of the agreements which have come before have answered that question, the multinational corporations will decide. We the people have fought multiple movements to increase the number of people who are involved or who are included in the phrase, we the people. We have engaged in mass struggle to expand the definition of citizen to, to include former slaves, those who do, did not own property, women, labor, uh, KG, uh, I should get this one right, <laughs> uh, LGBTQ people and more. Uh, those struggles continue today, and of course, they are going to continue on into the future. 
Well, the wealthy elites have also fought for democratic rights, democratic rights for property and for corporations. With the enactment of the, Oregon, with the, enactment of the American Constitution, with its interstate commerce clause, they set up the world's first free trade area, ensuring that local and state uh, laws could not interfere with cross-state state commerce. Corporations have been given our constitutional rights through the U.S. court system. For instance, the Southern Pacific Railroad versus Santa Clara County decision in 1886 declared that corporations had 14th Amendment rights to equal protection and due process under law. More recently, the U.S. Supreme Court declared that because corporations are people, that limitations on corporate funding of elections were an infringement on the corporation's free speech rights and were not allowed. But corporations have not stopped just at attempting to get human rights nationally. Internationally, they have induced our elected officials in Washington, D.C. and the capitals of our, of our trading partners to enact these so-called free trade agreements. These agreements have formed a spider's web of corporate decision-making which covers the globe ensuring that multinational corporate interests uh, desire to make profits cannot be challenged by local, state, or national governments. If a multinational corporation perceives that their future profit-making ability has been harmed by a local, state, or national change in law or regulation, they can bring an investment state protection suit against a national government for either compensation or to overturn the law. These agreements, enacted one at a time, have in fact been a corporate coup against the democratic decision-making of we the people. NAFTA was the first agreement which included an investor protection, uh, investor state protection clause. Uh, almost all agreements since then have, in, have included this. These suits bypass national courts and are filed in one of two international private courts designed specifically to hear these cases. The most often used is actually run by the World Bank. Unlike American courts, the court process, or I, I should say unlike most American courts, uh, the court process is secret. The tribunal judges can only rule on the basis of trade rules with no consideration of other factors. The judges are quite often corporate lawyers or lobbyists. In fact, it's not unusual for a, representative, uh, for a representative of a suing corporation to be judged in the next case. One of the first investor state cases involved a Canadian supplier of a key chemical in the MTBE gasoline additive. MTBE is a possible human carcinogen, and when added to water, gives water a turpentine smell. So when MTBE started leaking into California's waters, the state banned its use. While the Canadian supplier was not the manufacturer, it still sued, claiming that its profit-making profit abilities had been harmed. This Canadian multinational corporation sued the United States federal government because of action of a state. An American company could not have brought such a suit against the U.S. government. Under investor to state protection clauses, only a foreign multinational corporation is allowed to bring such a suit. California was not even allowed to be present in the courtroom to defend its acts, but instead had to depend on the U.S. government to defend its interests. And we all know quite frequently that state interests are quite different than federal uh, interests. Recently, WikiLeaks released the intellectual property rights chapter uh, text of the Trans-Pacific Partnerships. There's a lot of reason to be concerned about, what, about what's in that uh, chapter, but I want to focus just on one, which is its effects on uh, affordable medicine. I've been HIV positive since 1985. I've been on HIV meds since 1990. Those meds today cost in the area of $31,000 a year. Uh, luckily, I have good insurance, uh, so it's affordable. But for people in low- and middle-income uh, nations, these are extremely high prices, and they could be a death sentence for people. But what saves them? Well, India saves them. India manufactures and distributes uh, generic HIV meds, price 
less than $100 annually. More than 100 million people have been able to take care of their HIV, uh, AIDS, uh, infections because of generic uh, drugs. The TPP release text shows a concerted attack on generic drug production in order to ensure the profits of big America, American multinational pharmaceutical uh, corporations. Uh, patent terms would be extended from 20 to 25 years at least, and greenwashing would be allowed. Greenwashing is the reformulation of existing medicines by, for instance, changing a pill into a liquid gel cap and then relicensing the, pa the patent or renewing it, uh, and of course thereby uh, preventing competition uh, by generics. The WTO has allowed the manufacture of generics even while the patent is in effect for nations where the high cost would result in severe hardship. The TPP would prohibit that manufacture. The TPP also sets up barriers to sharing of drug, of drug data. The original manufacturers must prove drug safety. By international agreement, manufacturers of generic may use that original data to prove their safety, but the TPP would prevent drug data sharing causing each generic manufacturer to go through years of expensive testing before manufacturing could start. And the TP also extends patents over surgical techniques, medical tests, and treatments which have not been patented up until this time. So we need to realize that these free trade agreements represent a corporate coup against democracy itself, and we need to defeat them. We need to defeat the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and we need to turn our sights on those agreements which are already in effect and say no. No to corporate trade agreements, no to the corporate coup. Good afternoon, my name is Greg Pallison. I'm the Vice President and Political Director of the Association of Western Pulp and Paper Workers Union. And we represent people mostly in force related jobs um, in, in the paper industry. As you said, Oregon and, and the Pacific Northwest is known as, um, you know, forestry-related. And we all know, including myself, how controversial logging and uh, the issues related to forestry are. And should be, because this country has developed some of the best, uh, most stringent logging practices in the world. And yet, trade agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, wipe those out as we go on. So I want to use the paper industry as, a, as an example of what has happened, not just to the paper industry, but throughout um, manufacturing in the United States. You know, a lot of us, we, we don't want things in our backyard, right? Um, we want it done elsewhere, and then we shift that responsibility. And so in Oregon, um, and in the Pacific Northwest, we have fewer paper mills, um, fewer lumber mills and sawmills than we've ever had in the last 75 years. And yet, demand for certain products um, within those is it, as high as it is, as, or as high as it's ever been. And m many of the products, of course, now are imports and come in on, on, from other countries. The biggest reason for this is multinational corporations. There are hardly any small or medium-sized pulp or paper operations um, or, or logging operations in the United States. It's multinational corporations that are really you know, kind of scamming the system, and I'll give you a couple examples of that. So Oregon's known as a great recycled city, right? Um, which is fantastic. Recovered waste paper um, is, is a big, one of the big issues or big things that are, that are uh, recycled. The Blue Heron paper mill in Oregon City closed in 2011. It was a 100% recovered waste paper mill. And yes, it's an ugly facility. Most all manufacturing facilities are not pretty. But yet, they retooled over the years to produce paper products that were in high demand using 100% recovered waste paper. They filed bankruptcy in 2011, went out of business, um, even though they had orders for the next year. One of the main reasons that there's you know, a number of reasons that play into it, but one of the main reasons they filed bankruptcy was they could not afford to continue to purchase recovered waste paper. Even though there was enough supply in the Pacific Northwest, especially the Portland area, to do that. So the reason they could not continue to purchase recovered waste paper is recovered waste paper is a commodity. And for the most part, China sets the price of what you pay. And China has uh, tremendous illegal subsidies, 
um, that they're able to continue to do, even though these trade agreements that are supposed to prevent these subsidies from happening, um, they happen, and in part, because the multinational corporations, Georgia Pacific, International Paper, Warehouser, and the list goes on, um, are the ones that are investing overseas and investing in China. And so there's not an interest to pursue enforcement of the trade agreements that are there, of the language that is in the ones that are there that should protect us. I find it a little hard to believe that 70% of recovered waste paper in the United States is exported. 70%. That's, that's you know, so what we're really doing in many ways is we're making the environment worse. So we have politicians that will um, pass and push for strong environmental laws here and labor laws and, and laws that protect us. The MTB um, example is, is a prime one. And so politicians will push for these strong you know, um, laws here and yet they'll say, here, go to China or go somewhere else or go to, go to you know, anywhere, South America. And you don't have to abide by those. And many of these trade agreements simply have an environmental clause that says, as a, as a country, you have to have environmental regulations. They, they don't play even on what's there. On the, uh, on the mills that have closed, and I, I could go through a, a list, and I'll, I'll give you some examples. Um, Warehouser in North Bend years ago closed. That equipment is now in Taiwan, producing the same products that we made here. Boise St. Helens, Oregon, had a, paper, a pulp mill. The pulp mill's closed, that equipment's been dismantled, sent overseas, um, producing the same products we have here. International Paper in Albany was, again, this international paper, that was a profitable mill. We know that we represent the workers there, and we had profit sharing. They closed that mill and another one in, uh, in the south, um, and that equipment, again, was dismantled and shipped overseas. I worked for Warehouser in Longview, Washington. Um, two huge multi-million dollar paper machines that were there were closed, one in 2001 and one in 2004. And every time these closures happen, most of the, the companies mostly have the same announcement, um, low demand for the product, and that these, these um, mills, the equipment, cannot compete on the world market. That's propaganda. The mill I worked at had gone through a $30 million retool rebuild about a year and a half before they close it. And they work the tax breaks in the systems through the trade agreements and through the U.S. to be able to do this. And as we speak today, the two multi-million dollar paper machines that Weyerhaeuser claimed could not compete on the world market are producing the very same products they made here, but they're in China. And give you another example on the, on the tax system and what happens, and then the impact on, on jobs in the, in the area. Um, a few years ago, there was what's called black liquor tax, and I won't go through it, it's fairly complex, but mills burn what's called biomass and, and black liquor to produce um, energy to, to man, for the manufacturing system. And a combination of 2009 and 2010, international paper alone received a little over $3 billion in tax credits because they were burning was considered biomass, black liquor, they'd add biodiesel to it. It was unintended tax break, but they worked the system. So, and, and understand this is just one company, International Paper, Warehouser, Georgia Pacific, all of them did this. So in a two-year time period, they had over $3 billion in tax breaks, claiming they needed that to keep the U.S. industry afloat, claiming they needed, the, you know, in order to keep jobs here. At the same time, they did a $4 billion investment in Indonesia, $2 billion investment in Russia, bought 15 mills in China, and have expanded elsewhere. So, you know, they, they work the system. They, they say that in order to compete, they need um, these tax breaks and different things in the, in the trade agreements, and it really, it's a, it's a scam job. And as I said, the, not only do the jobs leave, but the equipment and manufacturing facilities themselves are completely dismantled and, and moved overseas. So, can uh, end with this. Um, you hear a lot about the national deficit, right? How many of you hear much about the trade deficit? Yeah. And so, I'm going to use the states and the counties as an example. Forget about the national deficit for a minute. Most of the states in our country are broke. Many of the counties are broke, especially rural counties and rural areas. So, as have the state governments and the rural and, and county governments grown so huge that they've consumed our tax dollars? The answer is clearly no. So why have they lost the tax base, the tax dollars, to support education, um, you know, and, and everything they need? It's because of two main reasons. Tax breaks to the rich 
and we've lost our tax base because we've, we've lost our jobs of offshoring. Uh, and um, that's, that's the, the loss of jobs and the tax base is one of the main reasons we have a, a national deficit along with two wars, and I won't get into that part. But, you know, so it's, it's really detrimental on um, rural communities especially. And as I said, you know, as controversial as most all manufacturing is, the, the United States has the most stringent laws in the world, and we ought to encourage manufacturing here and do things. We do it the best, the cleanest, the most responsible way there is, and, and continue these jobs. China now produces more paper products than anybody in the world. And believe it or not, China is worried about India because there's been this shift of manufacturing. It went to Canada, then it went to Mexico, then it's gone to the Asian countries, and now it's going to India. Cheap labor, hardly any environmental laws, hardly any labor laws. And these trade agreements allow for that to happen. And as I said with our politicians, I mean, I, you know, to me there's such hypocrites, so many of them, that will push for strong laws here and then sign trade agreements that absolutely wipe those out. And so they're creating, you know, all this damage, and especially, as you said, on, on the environmental side, and it's, it's shameful. Thank you. Swagger. Um, first off, I want to thank our uh, other panelists um, and for Reverend uh, Santos Lyons, Lyons for illustrating why it's so important that we act right now to stop what David called the corporate coup, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This forum really could not be more timely because as we speak, there, there are TPP negotiators meeting in Singapore um, to hash out the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, the U.S. Trade Representative is really pushing hard uh, to complete a deal, regardless of how it's going to impact, um, how it's going to devastate, actually, workers across borders, um, you know, making it easier for corporations to shift jobs to wherever labor is cheapest or environmental regulations are the weakest. Um, or uh, the devastating impact it'll have on environmental policies that we need now to uh, combat uh, climate change so that we can prevent the next mega typhoon uh, so that um, we don't see another devastation as we did in the Philippines. Um, or the attacks on our democracy, uh, taking um, the power to influence uh, public policies to protect public health or safety, or um, in the Philippines, the right to protect their land. Um, and they're taking it away from people and the communities and putting it directly into the hands of corporations. Um, when asked why the TPP um, was so secret, why uh, people could not um, see what's being negotiated in our names, the U.S. Trade Representative said that if people knew what was in it, it could never be passed. <laughs> so while the U.S. Trade Representative is hell-bent on um, being able to announce a final deal at this these negotiations in Singapore, it's very unlikely that uh, they can finish it in such short time. However, it's very clear that they are gonna be bullying countries to make huge concessions. And the US negotiators have already backed away from their very weak environmental uh, regulations. So you know, th this is clearly going to be a step in the wrong direction. Um, you know, they're expecting to do a frame, framework announcement, um, which will be a bravado announcement saying that uh, they all agree. Um, we're not there yet, um, but you know, we're getting close. For those of you who have been in uh, the TPP fight for some time, you know that Fast Track is the linchpin in defeating the TPP. Um, Fast Track's federal legislation that uh, limits congressional authority over um, trade policy making. And it does that by um, eliminating the regular debate and amendment procedures. So if we stop fast track, um, it'll virtually be impossible for the TPP to be approved. On the flip side, if fast track is granted, uh, then it's gonna be really difficult for us to stop the TPP. 
Um, because of the amazing work done by many, many of you in the room here, uh, we've had a lot of success. We uh, were able to get every one of Oregon's House Democrats to sign on to a letter opposing fast track. Um, and, you know, that was, they were opposing fast track legislation from 2002. It expired uh, in 2007. <coughs> Um, and if we can keep it dead, then we have a really good chance of stopping the TPP. Uh, across the country, 151 uh, Democrats uh, opposed fast track and 70, or, I'm sorry, uh, 27 Republicans also signed on to letters. Now that is a strong show uh, of opposition. Um, so it'd be very difficult to get fast track through. Um, unfortunately, our opposition are not uh, taking the hint, instead they're mobilizing. So we are gonna have to do the same and we're going to have to fight back hard. Um, but the work that we've done is really proof of the power of collective organizing. Um, and I wanna remind everyone that we have huge victories in the trade justice movement under our belt. Um, when we uh, organize between environmental uh, groups, between labor, between human rights organizations, back in 1999 in Seattle, we shut down the World Trade Organization. And then uh, when we organized across borders, um, we shut down the free trade area of the Americas, and I have no doubt that if we work together, we can stop the Trans-Pacific Partnership too. Thank you. You've been watching presentations given at our Alliance for Democracy Organized Forum on December 7th here in Portland, talking about why we need to oppose the corporate coup, which is the web, of so-called free trade agreements. You can help. Wherever you are, call your U.S. representative and your two U.S. senators with this simple message. We want to know what's being done in our name. Therefore, release the text now. And two, don't grant President Obama fast-track authority. Fast-track authority requires Congress to give up its constitutional responsibility to oversee trade relations between the U.S. and foreign nation. It's designed to slide this agreement through Congress with minimal review and debate. So please call today. And thanks to all of you for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye. If you think corporations bought free speech before, Now that they're human, they'll buy even more. Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock. Cause I never heard my money talk.